I mean, asked to talk about connecting uh, Australian beef uh, to, uh, to growing uh, Asian demand. And, uh, and I'll, I'll probably have a reasonably northern focus uh, as I see that you know, there's a lot of capacity to develop the north of Australia to I increase beef production and connect into, into Asia. And I'll, uh, I'll run with sort of you know, positive and negatives of the opportunity into, into Asia. So I'm going to use a couple of CPC examples just to, to give you a feel for what we've done in connecting uh, our beef production system into Asia. So, CPC is Australia's largest private beef producer. We run about 20 cattle stations across northern Australia, uh, close to 6 million hectares. Uh, we've got two feedlots in Indonesia and uh, about equal numbers of staff in Australia and Indonesia. And uh, we're 95% foreign owned uh, by uh, Terra Firma, one of the UK's largest private equity uh, funds. So in terms of what does that look like on a map, um, predominantly NTWA and, and then spread across Queensland, our northern herd uh, plugs into predominantly uh, Southeast Asia uh, through, uh, through live export uh, into uh, two feedlots in Sumatra. And then also uh, we do work with a couple of exporters at times into Vietnam, supplying uh, live slaughter cattle into uh, abattoir in Darwin with AACO. Our Queensland operations are predominantly uh, into box beef, uh, either through grass finishing or thanks to drought in Queensland for the last four years, uh, finished through, through feedlot. And, uh, and that's, uh, so it gives us a good spread across a variety of markets. So I suppose connecting Australian supply to, to demand, and, and it's really how do we take this and, uh, and turn it into this. Um, and that's, uh, that's our, our beef on shelf in, in China a couple of years ago with a strong focus on the people that live inside that circle, with there being more people inside that circle now than outside of that circle. Um, that's, that's where we as a company, and, and I think uh, many people in the red meat industry see a lot of opportunity. So I suppose if you look at, step back and look at the whole herd, and, and I've, I've got a couple of slides that are probably going to cover off on what Trish has, has covered off on, but I mean, Australia has had a huge drop in, uh, in beef product herd size, but our, uh, our beef production is, uh, has, uh, has fallen quite a bit, but still sitting at reasonably average levels. I think the big challenge that, that we're facing is if we don't get rain across much of Australia in the next four weeks, uh, the wet season is going to cut out pretty hard and we're going to see a big run of cattle onto the market, which could substantially change that. So those of you that, that don't know, the wet and dry cycle of, of northern Australia, sort of you know, northern New South Wales north, is, uh, starts to close out about Easter time. And uh, having flown all over northern Australia in the last four days, it's, uh, there's a lot more brown than green, which is very unusual at this time of the year. So in terms of connecting Northern Australia, Northern Australia used to have a lot of uh, meat processing plants. The number of ports for live export hasn't really changed, um, but the number of plants at, in 2015-16 is, uh, has really, uh, is you know, certainly a lot less plants. However, plants with a lot more capacity, plants hopefully with more efficiency and more connection to market. It's exciting to see for us, new plant about to be opened in Broome and a, and a new facility uh, that's operating in, in Darwin. But again, much of northern Australia is a very long road freight distance from, uh, from meat processing and, uh, and a substantial road freight cost. So when you're making decisions, whether you go live export or, or uh, into meat processing facilities in northern Australia, the road freight cost and the shrink and the time has a, has a huge impact on, uh, on decision making. Um, meat processing up uh, first, actually flipped a coin on, on this. It wasn't me trying to have a shot at the meat processing industry first. But just to put in perspective some of the challenges and opportunities, and I'll come to, uh, come to live export in, in a minute. Certainly meat processing gives uh, a lot of optionality, uh, domestic versus export markets, very much cut space marketing. You can break the carcass up and send to a significant number of markets. Um, significant uh, cost savings compared to live export on a per kilo basis on shipping. Uh, container shipping of beef is, is much cheaper than live cattle and certainly growing demand for, uh, for carcasses to be broken down even more with Australia in over 100 markets now for beef. Some of the challenges, the Australian processing costs and uh, an increasing competition for cattle. If you look at uh, Australia's meat processing costs, uh, we're more than, you know, we're nearly two and a half times that of the US, about three times Brazil, one and a half times New Zealand. We're about 20 times cheaper in our two abattoirs in Indonesia. Now, different spec, but uh, it, it really plays into the equation. And up to 10, to, uh, sorry, it's meant to be China, up to 10 times higher than, uh, than China down the bottom. Live export, I suppose the advantages for live export out of northern Australia is location to market. 
the ability to feed in country with lower priced feed. So Indonesia in particular and Vietnam really focusing on feeding byproducts from grain production, grain, grain, byproducts from tapioca, uh, feeding uh, coffee byproducts, bread byproducts, um, and, uh, and that makes feeding in those countries quite efficient. Local labour does help with the cost. Um, however, our feedlot in Indonesia, and I'll show a small video in, the minute, in a minute, is uh, we've, we've taken the decision to go predominantly mechanised uh, labour. I'll show you the only manual labour we've got left. Good growing demand. The big advantage that live export has that we see is uh, connecting fresh offal into the market. The best way to transport offal fresh to the growing markets of, uh, of South East Asia at the moment is in with side, inside the animal. Um, and taking it up out of an abattoir is, is pretty challenging. Some of the challenges, Australia's live exporting costs are higher than anywhere in the world. They're exceptionally expensive. The quality of ships that have to come to Australia can be twice the cost of ships that can go to South America on a per metre basis. Um, there's increasing competition for shipping and shipping space. Um, you take out the ability for cuts based marketing. The animal you put into that country is all you can sell in that country. So if you're taking live cattle to an, an Asian country that puts no additional value on loin cuts compared to butt cuts, you've got to be getting a lot for those butt cuts or a lot for that offal to, uh, to make it worth taking that animal up live. And, and, uh, and I think we'll see that with China, um, with uh, a lot of views on live animals going to China, there's going to have to be a, a continued maturation of the market up there to start paying more for some of the high value cuts for live cattle to head to China, plus the feed challenge. Um, some of the other, uh, once you're in country, it's very hard to re-export. Some of the big challenges that live export faces is government regulation costs, inefficiency through, uh, through DAF, and the red meat processing industry found the same challenge. The Australian maritime rules and, and live export rules, SCAS is, uh, is very expensive. We compete head on with local cattle ourselves in Indonesia uh, that have no animal welfare cost uh, applied to them and we, we have 16 people ourselves as a company in market every night at every single abattoir that we supply. Um, importing country government regulation continues to be challenging. Even though we've got free trade agreements, we are seeing some challenges in those countries. So through Southeast Asia, I think the, the biggest opportunity is Australia's location. Uh, China is going to have a big impact on Southeast Asia, whether we supply the market or not. Its ability to pull meat out of other countries. We used to see Thailand as a net exporter of live cattle. Uh, China has basically sucked up most of Thailand's cattle, and uh, Thailand is now an importer of cattle from Australia. Asian beef consumption. On, uh, on your left, uh, looking at per capita growth out to 2024, seeing huge growth potential in Vietnam in particular, Indonesia and, and China. Moving uh, closer to, to your right, the volumes of, of beef that are required by, by China and, and much of Southeast Asia are exciting. I think the biggest challenge for the Australian beef industry is productivity. The, uh, the productivity rate in Northern Australian beef production is not keeping up with inflation and the opportunity is for those to, uh, to master how they, can, uh, how they can keep productivity moving faster than the cost of inflation and catch up the last few years. I see this as a huge opportunity for Northern Australian and, and beef production rather than a problem. If we can, uh, we can continue to focus on genetics and efficiency, the opportunity to make Australia more competitive is, is there. And I'll touch on a couple of other countries in a minute. If you look at the growth in live export, Vietnam has certainly been a, a very big growth market. It's quite clear that the cattle that go into northern Vietnam, their beef ends up in southern China. Um, but it's exciting to see the increase in demand from, uh, from southern Vietnam where the beef is being consumed in country. Vietnam's a country that will take Indian buffalo and uh, it's exciting that, uh, to see a you know, developing market actually pay a price premium for quality beef. It's interesting, I heard this morning a comment about quality, just to touch on it for a minute. And I think when we look at quality for South East Asia, we really need to look through the eye of the consumer up there, not through the Australian eyes. In Indonesia, quality for our customers is lean beef. Uh, it is beef that is, uh, is, is, uh, is high yielding. And uh, the last thing that our, customer in Indonesia, our customers in Indonesia would want would be high marbled cattle. They, uh, they're a lean beef market. And I think when we start thinking about these markets, we've got to not look through the eyes of just Australian demand. Just touching on Indonesia, um, you know, it's surprising now that uh, with the increase in beef price, which I'll show, we're now seeing more pork eaten in Indonesia than beef. Uh, Indonesia being the world's most populous Muslim country, um, with pork being very hard to, to procure up there unless it's in very western supermarkets. Um, the, the price of beef is starting to limit consumption 
and uh, their herd being killed out. About 95 per cent of beef in Indonesia is traded through the wet market system. We're seeing a growth in supermarkets at the same time as we're seeing a growth in wet, wet markets. Um, they're the major supermarkets up there. Their share of the beef trade in Indonesia is very small. Um, predominantly driven by traffic, um, to get to a supermarket is very difficult. Um, cost and, uh, and the, the structure of those with wealth often have maids and maids go to, uh, to wet markets. So uh, just a picture of the increase in price uh, in, in Indonesia uh, for the last few years. So I suppose this shows you what our business in Indonesia looks like in, uh, in a couple of minutes on, at one of our sites. We get the most out of our trucks. This is about the only manual process we've got left, is, uh, is chopping silage. You might have seen in there some uh, sapi bintang or the, the barley cattle, those little red cattle that look half like deer. Um, the social responsibility and, and connecting to um, it didn't go so well, connecting to uh, the local um, uh, lo local programs is really important for uh, for success in uh, in dealing in, in Indonesia. So sort of, hopefully this keeps going. Um, I mean, one of the, the only ways to, to interact and, and have success connecting Australia to, to Southeast Asia markets, and particularly Indonesia for us, is on ground connection. The, the conversations need to happen on ground. Um, you've got to be in the market and, uh, and in the market regularly. So just to touch on, uh, on China, China's beef consumption is, uh, is expected to increase to around 8 million tonnes by, uh, by 2020. To put that in perspective, uh, certainly heard stats of global beef trade being about six million tonnes, so um, where we sit sit today. So you can do all sorts of things with statistics out of, uh, out of China, but to, to think that we're going to be close to somewhere near or more than global beef uh, trade in their, their consumption, they're going to have a huge impact. Our experience in China was taking whole carcasses and quarter carcasses and eight cut carcass beef up to China frozen, cutting frozen uh, and then and repacking. Uh, a lot of people have had, had a go at it. It's not, certainly not as simple as it sounds. Really strong uh, link with customers. People were really keen on the safety story. Um, they, uh, they really liked the fact that you could show a video of, uh, of you know, the cattle in Australia back to, uh, to the farm. Getting paid for it was, was a big challenge after a while. I think as we develop into, into new markets, and particularly China, our competitive advantage at the moment is certainly our clean green image. Uh, it's certainly our trust and safety image, but if that's all we've got, we're not going to last. Uh, other countries are going to work out how to get safe. Brazil's now down to two states with, uh, with foot and mouth disease. You know, I remember five, six years ago, people laughing about the possibility of Brazil getting foot and mouth disease free, and uh, don't, don't laugh, they're getting there. 
Brazil's production continues to increase. I think the big thing on their live export front is 80 per cent of their live exports currently go to Venezuela in 2014. Venezuela is turning into a basket case. Um, those cattle will go somewhere um, and the potential for them to, uh, to hit North Africa or even Vietnam is, is quite real. Uh, I think we shouldn't underestimate the uh, ability of Colombia to send cattle into Southeast Asia anytime soon. The other thing that we're seeing is, uh, is Brazil really start to put large numbers of cattle through feedlots and, uh, and increase their efficiency and bring their, their, their carcass weights up and their speed of turn off uh, back. The, uh, the days of, uh, of them taking years to, to finish their cattle, I think, are, are over. Um, the other thing that Brazil's got a, a real competitive advantage on at the moment is, uh, is the price of their cattle due to currency. India is something that we, we certainly shouldn't take, uh, take for granted. Um, the domestic consumption and export uh, figures for, for, for India are huge. With the, the bull population that's coming off their Indian buffalo milk production system is growing very, very rapidly. They're, uh, they're targeting markets that we have, uh, have had strong uh, positions in or other Western exporting markets have. At the moment, they're, they're still in, uh, in countries that have got foot and mouth disease. The pressure they're putting on uh, traditional markets and their ability to get into new markets is, is something that's, uh, that's quite solid. So I suppose on the, on the upside though, looking, uh, looking uh, forward, we certainly see um, uh, the OECD countries' price of beef in real terms is probably going to flatten or, or sit, sit uh, even lower over the next, uh, the next few years. Um, but if we look forward to, um, to the Southeast Asian markets, their ability to pay more money for, for beef and the increasing demand is really positive and it's something that I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited about. Thank you.